Powerhouse Thursday, episode 13 of our exploration through Scripture, specifically through the book of Matthew. Matthew presents Jesus, or Yeshua, in a very Jewish light, according to the first century Judaism. As we journey through Matthew, we're going to continue to take some stops along the way to grab a hold of content in context. As we take deeper looks at particular passages, our goal is to add understanding to the passage by looking at the cultural and linguistic meanings of words and phrases as to how they were used in the first century. What we are doing is building a solid backdrop for the truth of God's word in our understanding, likened to building a puzzle. One piece of the puzzle doesn't seem like much, but when you begin to connect the pieces together, a clear picture begins to come into view. So as we journey, we will stop off each week and pick up pieces to the puzzle. So tonight we're going to stop off at Matthew 20, and we're going to start with verse 25 and see what pieces we can add to our picture. So are you ready for some exploration and discovery? Yes. Right. Matthew chapter 20. Now this is where Matthew gives the reason for Jesus' death on the cross. Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to start at verse 25. Okay. And it says this, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this same story is also in Mark 10, 45, and because uh, it's synoptic gospels, and so these two stories are in this, but we're going to stay in Matthew. So here we see Jesus himself as the primary example of servanthood. So Jesus will give his life as a ransom. So let's zero in on that, that word ransom. And this is one of those pieces of the puzzle that I alluded to earlier. The Greek word for ransom is lutron. And lutron means the piece, uh, excuse me, the price of release often used of the money paid to release slaves. And in verse 28, it says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That word for, in Greek it's ante, ante, and it means in place of, and signifies the notion of the exchange and substitution of Jesus's life on the cross for all those who accept his payment for their sin. Now, ransom was looked to as a payment. Ancient Jews understood sin as a debt. So what are the controlling metaphors for sin in the ancient world for Jews is that of a debt. And it needed to be paid up. So they saw it as every, this is the way they saw it, every sin that you do you go into the red in a ledger, in a heavenly ledger, in heaven. So they saw this as if there was a treasury up in heaven, and every time you sin, you go into debt. And so the animal sacrifices that were paid, it pays off the debt of sin. So in Jesus' language, Aramaic, the word Hova for this, for ransom. It actually means both sin and debt. And this is why in some translations of the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew 
six eleven, and and most of us know that. In verse eleven, it says, "Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors." And this is why that word is used in this place, because this is how the ancient Jews, this is how they saw sin. When you sin, you go into the red, and it's a debt. And the only way to be paid off is through blood. And they had an animal sacrifice, and so it needed to, needed. isn't that interesting? Yes. So sometimes you see it as forgive us our sins in some translations, and other times you will say forgive us our debts. So this is because the word means the same thing. This is when you sin, you go into debt. So Jesus then gives his life as a ransom, as a payment to God in order to forgive sin and eliminate the debt. And, and then in Matthew 1, 21, we read, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus, in light of all we've been, what we've been saying, Jesus giving his life as a ransom, as a payment, that saves them from their debt of sin. So that is what he's, he's coming to save them from their debt of sin. He's going to pay the ransom for their debt. And that's the theology going on here in this passage. What Jesus is talking about in this whole idea of one person, one person dying as an atonement for many. Now there's another word, atonement. Atonement is the process of paying a ransom. So this whole process is an atonement. That's the atonement is the, the payment for this debt, for this sin, the ransom. And uh, the whole idea of one person dying for the atonement for many would have been very well known for his disciples, according to the Jewish theology, from the writings before and after the New Testament. I mean, as we'll see, as it's written in historical stories and writings, uh, for example, the writings of the Maccabees, and of the stories of their martyrs giving their lives for Israel. Um, they, that those stories uh, speak of through the blood of those righteous martyrs and the atonement of their death, God rescues Israel. So this whole idea of somebody atoning for many is a very common idea at this time when Jesus was doing this. Their point being that the deaths of the righteous make atonement. And, and atonement are made with the spilling of blood. So all this stuff, it starts in the Torah, the Old Testament, and it bubbles up through the Jewish tradition, and then we see it played out through Jesus. Recapitulating the atonements for sins with the blood of animals by himself being the sacrifice, the final sacrifice for the atonement of, our, of sins uh, for many. So the theology of Matthew chapter 20 and Mark 10 is grounded in well-known Jewish traditions of atonement at that time. And so that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Ransom, paying a debt, sin being a debt, and that's why those words are used as they are even in the Lord's Prayer. So let's head over to Matthew 21 now. Matthew 21, starting with verse 1. It says this, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of the beast of burden. So here we have Jesus in Jerusalem. The first thing that Jesus does when he gets into Jerusalem is he enters the city riding on a donkey. 
Now, this event described in Matthew's gospel um, is in terms of the fulfillment of scripture, which is Zechariah 9.9, and that was quoted in there. The, the, the text states that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah, saying, quote, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of, of a beast burden, Zechariah 9.9. So Matthew 21, um, right at the beginning, uh, citing he cites Zechariah 9.9. And what's interesting is this. The use of this verse was also fairly well known in the Judaism of Jesus' day, as well as following uh, after Jesus' day. As we see in the writings uh, of the Talmud. Now the Talmud, and we've referred to that before, the Talmud are Jewish writings of rabbis of discussions, discussions of the Torah, discussions of the Old Testament. And they write these down. And, uh, and so you begin to see their discussions uh, of how they have it. And, and this is uh, uh, an example from the Babylonian Talmud. And we see Matthew, we see Matthew's use of Zechariah reflected in these writings here, because now they're going to discuss it. They're going to discuss some of Matthew's writings. Uh, and, and, and this is what it says. Um, uh, or they're going to allude to what Matthew alluded to as far as how the Messiah will be coming in, rather. It says this, Rabbi Joshua, son of Levi, raises a contradiction between two biblical descriptions of the coming Messiah. The broader context of Rabbi Joshua's words here is that the discussion of the Messiah, who will he be, what will he do, what will his name be, what kind of things will we know him by once he arrives. And so Rabbi Joshua points out an apparent contradiction between two biblical passages that he interprets as of uh, messianic verses because they're looking for the Messiah. So here's what Rabbi Joshua says. It is written, there came with the clouds of heaven, one like the son of man. And he's quoting Daniel 7, 13. And then another text is written, he comes lowly and riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9, 9. So Rabbi Joshua calls these contradictions of the Messiah because one text says in Daniel 7, uh, says that the Messiah is going to come on the clouds of heaven and is going to be a big heavenly divine experience. And on the other hand, Zechariah says that it's, he's going to come lowly riding on a donkey. So these two uh, versions of the arrival of the Messiah seem to be very, very different. And one is spectacular and divine, and the other being humble, riding on a donkey. So here's their, here's their response from, their, from, their, from the Talmud, from the rabbi's discussion of, of sorting these two out. This is their response. And the, their, their response is as follows. If the people of Israel are victorious or righteous, the Messiah will come with the clouds of heaven. But if not, and Israel is not victorious, the Messiah will come lowly riding on a donkey. And that's how the writers of the Talmud decided this, which is interesting. What's interesting about the New Testament text in Matthew is that both of these verses that we see discussed in the Talmud are also used of Jesus. So as you can see in Matthew um, 24, 30, Jesus says this, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And, the, and he, he's taking that from Zechariah 12, 10. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And so the Talmud says that it's going to be one of the two ways. If the generation is righteous, the Messiah will come on clouds of heaven. And if the generation is unrighteous, the Messiah will come meek and lowly riding on a donkey. But what Matthew says is no, it's not going to be one or the other. It's not going to be either or. It's not going to be either on the clouds of heaven or meek and lowly riding on a donkey. 
Matthew says it will be both. It will be both and. That is, the Messiah will first come into Jerusalem, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey, thereby fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, 9, and then also at the second coming, the Son of Man will come Ooh. on the clouds of heaven, thereby fulfilling Daniel 7.13. Way to go, Matthew. <laughs> so soon after Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey, there's an event that happens that scholars call the cleansing of the temple. And some have interpreted this event as Jesus' condemnation of the temple. The idea would be that Jesus being against the temple and in cleansing the temple by kicking out the money chaser, uh, changers, that Jesus is publicly saying the temple is corrupt and the temple is no good anymore and I've come so that we don't need the temple anymore. And, and, and many people have made these kind of conclusions on Jesus' uh, uh, on this happening. But actually, if you look closely at the Greek language and the passage, if you look carefully and look at uh, from what the prophets that Jesus cites, it's not Jesus' condemnation of the temple, but rather Jesus is cleansing the temple from misuse. Those who would use it for personal gain or for unrighteousness. Jesus is cleansing that away from the temple and thereby saving the temple from those who would misuse it. So let's read the text before we unpack some of the particulars. Matthew 21, verse 12. The, uh, Jesus cleansing the temple. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now the Greek word here for drove out or cast out is ek ekbala. And we're going to get back to that in just a moment. Verse 13. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And he got that from Isaiah 56. But you make it a den of robbers. And he got that from Jeremiah 7. <laughs> And so immediately after, verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them there. Um, now, that's the end of that verse. And there are a few things um, in this passage that I, I, wanna, I wanna stop and take note of. Now, first of all, if Jesus was condemning the temple with his, this action, Jesus wouldn't have stuck around afterwards, right after this in, uh, uh, cleansing and stayed in the temple and healed the blind and the lame in the temple. Mm. So it's not Jesus being against the temple as God's house, but rather Jesus is against those in the temple who Jesus feels are misusing. Mm. Notice that Isaiah 56 is cited here. My house should be called a house of prayer. Jesus still refers to the temple as God's house and has reverence for God's house. Yeah. Jesus is not condemning the temple here. He's just rather kicking out the riffraff. Mm -hmm. So um, let's look at the word ekbala. Now ekbala is the same word. Uh, ekbala is the same word that Jesus used when referring to casting out demons. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's that word um, and it's throughout scripture, throughout, throughout the gospels in many places where he casts out demons. It's ekbala. He ekbalas the demons. And that same word is what he's doing here. He's going to the, to the people that are misusing the temple and he's ekbala in them. Just as he did to demons. Mm -hmm. and, and he's not, he, what he's doing he is, is he, he's cleansing, he's cleansing for, for the individual, for people. Just as he cleansed for a, removing the demon to mm -hmm. save that person, and uh, he's removing these misusers uh, to save the temple and what it's been used for. And so that's kind of interesting. Um, so these little pieces of puzzles by themselves 
um, may not be much. But as you go through scripture, you're going to be hearing ransom, payment, debt. And these things are going to click on. You're going to go, I know that. I know that. And you're going to see Jesus doing things. And whereas a lot of people were just going to guess, these things, the, the Holy Spirit is going to bring it back to your remembrance. And you're going you're gonna to be able to piece this together. Not only that, but the things that you receive from this point on will be laid on this kind of a backdrop. Well, you have a greater understanding and they will be more rich for you in understanding. And that's the goal. So with all that said, uh, all that we covered today, notice that nowhere did Jesus ever instruct us to build temples. Think about it. He never told us to build church buildings. His instruction to us, to the church, was to make disciples. And where did Jesus mostly train and equip disciples? Where? On the road. Everywhere. On the road? Yeah. In homes. In homes? Everywhere else out there. W uh, specifically? Mountainsides. Mountainsides? The lake. Lake. Um, temple courts. In temple courts. Uh, an upper room. Mm -hmm. And it's here, there, and everywhere. Why? Because the original purpose for building the temple was to host the presence of God. Um, in the Holy of Holies. And when Jesus paid the final ransom payment for our debt, for our sin, we became the place in which the presence of God lives in. Mm. That's good. So before the payment was made through the blood and the final sacrifice of Jesus, people had to go to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the building to interact with God. But the Bible says in Matthew 27, 51, that when Jesus dies on the died on the cross, the veil that separated us from God's presence was torn from top to bottom in the temple. And now we not only have access to God's presence, but we now are able to host the presence of God himself in us. So question, why are we building church buildings today? <laughs> Mm. Hmm. Could it be one of those things where God says, but I yes. never asked you to right. do that? Mm. Mm. I think the focus that Jesus in the Great Commission was to make disciples, not to build a building or a big church. And that's why here at Powerhouse, our focus is to not to build a big church, but to build big people spiritually, emotionally. And, 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 and with full strength physically. And, and so this is what, and, and, and I don't think it's bad, I don't think it's evil, <laughs> a, a church building, because even with Jesus, he honored and respected the temple. But he did give specific instructions to his, his people to go make disciples. The focus is first and foremost, making disciples, train, equip them. Where that was done was wherever and however you can do that. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, again, more of the reason why um, right now we're, because of this crisis, we're, wherever, we're meeting wherever we can. Wow, that seems really like what we were told to do and, and commanded is to make disciples wherever, in a room, in a house, in a, in a building, outside, online. wherever it'd be, online. Yeah, if, we, if there would have been online, it would have been that too. And so that's why we're coming to you online, because we're equipping and training and following the commands of the Lord uh, every which way and wherever we can. And, uh, and I, I trust that this, these teachings for you will help build and equip and train you in, in more of knowing who God is, how he is, what his heart is like, and build a solid backdrop to the things that you are going to learn in the future and also for the things that you've already learned. So with that, uh, this includes this episode of our Bible exploration of Matthew. I hope you join us again next week 
same bat time, same bat station. So with that, I say adios, amigos. Thank you.